Hello everybody and welcome back to Movies with Mia. If you're new to the channel, hi! I'm Mia Tiffany and here we are watching the greatest classic films throughout history. Today we are watching the film On the Waterfront. Before we get into today's video, I would like to shout out my Golden Oscar patrons. Guys, thank you so much for your continued support of the channel. And if you're interested in exclusive MWM content, then please check out that Patreon link, which is in the description box below. Now, I wanted to let you guys know that my Patreon is currently under construction. I am still in the process of getting all of our full lengths out and up to date because there are several that are still not out yet. And I do appreciate your patience. Just want to let you guys know that. On the Waterfront was released in 1954, directed by Elia Kazan, starring Marlon Brando, Carl Malden, and Lee J. Cobb, with other notable performances by Rod Steiger, Pat Henning, Leif Erikson, <laughs> Leif Erikson, and James Westerfield. All right, guys, at this point, we are going to get into some historical background. For those of you who want to jump right onto the film reaction, go for it. But for those of you who want to stay, we're going to get right into it. And I am going to put a disclaimer out here that there was a ton of information on this film. So naturally, this is going to be a longer historical background. Um, but like I said, if you want to skip it and go right to the reaction, that is your prerogative, baby. The setting in which this movie takes place is loosely based on the underworld dealings of an organized crime syndicate. Now, there's no official name for this syndicate, this underworld syndicate. Um, however, according to Malcolm Johnson's series of articles covering this particular organized crime syndicate, there was a colonel he talked to, Colonel Garland Williams, who was quoted as calling this syndicate the combination. So I guess we can call it the combination for the sake of this video. Now, the combination originated during the prohibition times of the 1920s, which was a time when there was a lot of organized crime, a lot of smuggling alcohol, that kind of atmosphere. The combination stayed strong long after prohibition times due to its deep and powerful connections in law enforcement, politics, the government in general, and its business dealings, such as legitimate business front ownerships that were ploys for racketeering jobs, drug smuggling, and the underworld of gambling. The combination had operations all across the globe, from Europe to South America, even right here in the US, including California, Florida, New Jersey, and New York. All of the information that I pulled was from this series of articles written by Malcolm Johnson, who actually won the Pulitzer Prize for his work. And if you're interested in reading more about this crime syndicate, I have provided that link of where I found it um, down in the description box. So. If you want more knowledge on that, have at it. It is actually really interesting. Screenwriter Bud Schulberg wrote a screenplay based on Johnson's articles, as well as years of investigated research he conducted on the waterfront in New York. Director Elia Kazan was also very interested in creating a film on this topic and actually asked the very famous playwright Arthur Miller to collaborate on a screenplay. Miller agreed to and wrote a screenplay titled The Hook, which was later submitted to Harry Cohn of Columbia Pictures. Cohn was concerned about some of the union officials being depicted as crooked or as sideways, so he asked Miller to portray the antagonists as communists. Now, if you know the time in which this film was released, you know that that was a very, very sensitive topic because we are right in the height of the Red Scare, okay? So it was almost a little insensitive, I think, on Cohn's part, but whatever. Despite that, and very obviously, Miller refused, and after being asked yet again by Kazan to make the necessary changes, Miller pulled from the project. There was a lot of tension between Miller and Kazan at this time because Kazan, who was actually a communist and went on tape later saying he was a communist during this time, outed some of his fellow communists in Hollywood to the House Un-American Activities Committee. Very early on when you started out, you were a member of the Communist Party yes. and you actually testified against a lot of people that you'd worked with, named right. a lot of names. What, what did you hope to gain by that? 
gain nothing and just the truth. And that did not bode well with a lot of people in Hollywood. So he was not well liked by a lot of people. But Kazan eventually found Bud Schulberg and they both decided to create this film. Um, mind you, Schulberg's script had already been written at this point. So it was sort of already like a I guess a stars aligning moment. They both had an opportunity and they seized it, so they decided to collaborate on a film. They had first taken their idea to Daryl Zanuck, who was 20th Century Fox's studio head at the time, who initially agreed to produce the film. However, he later backed out publicly, saying that the film was not worthy of the technicolor of Cinemascope. Zanuck later revealed to Kazan and Schulberg his real reason for backing out of the project, saying, quote, who's gonna care about a bunch of sweaty longshoremen? And I wanted to include that and you'll see why a little later, but I just thought it was really funny that he said that. So hold on to that piece of information and you'll understand why. When no other studio would take on the project, Kazan and Schulberg eventually went to independent film producer, Sam Spiegel, who was looking for a big time film project to produce. So he eagerly agreed to produce this project. Spiegel secured distribution from Columbia Pictures, which was actually a big no-no for Schulberg, and he almost pulled out of it due to his high disdain for Harry Cohn. Spiegel ensured a deal that would keep Cohn from meddling in the project and convinced Schulberg to stay on the project. On the Waterfront would go on to be a commercial success. Remember when Daryl Zanuck said that nobody was gonna care about sweaty longshoremen? He was incredibly wrong. On the Waterfront would also go on to be nominated for 12 Oscars at the Academy Awards in 1955, winning eight of them, including Best Actor, which was awarded to Marlon Brando, and Best Picture, which was awarded to Steven Spiegel. On the Waterfront. Now, if I were Daryl Zanuck saying that nobody would care about sweaty longshoremen, I would feel pretty freaking stupid. <laughs> All right, now on to some interesting facts. If you had a chance to catch my previous video, you saw that Marlon Brando had worked with Kazan in both the stage version and the film version of A Streetcar Named Desire. He'd even considered Kazan as somewhat of a father figure. However though, Brando was extremely disinclined to work with Kazan again due to his cooperation with the House Un-American Activities Committee. So even though Brando was asked several times to take the part of Tony Malloy, he repeatedly refused. Kazan would eventually look for other actors, specifically Frank Sinatra, who had just received an Oscar for Best Supporting Actor for the film From Here to Eternity. It was Spiegel who had to convince Kazan to hire Brando, and it was both Spiegel and Schulberg who had to convince Brando to take the role of Tony Malloy. And just as a side note, I read that this really pissed off Frank Sinatra, and they were trying to give him another role in the film, which eventually fell through and resulted in Sinatra suing Sam Spiegel for $500,000. Now, I don't know the specifics of that case or if he won or not, but just to let you know, like, Sinatra was pissed. <laughs> now, much to Harry Cohn's dismay, much of the project was filmed on location in Hoboken, New Jersey. Being on location provided a realistic tone for the film, especially with the harsh winter conditions of the New Jersey waterfront. It was simply something that could not be recreated on a soundstage in Hollywood. Finally, after initially watching this film, Brando was actually really disappointed with his performance. He felt very embarrassed and very depressed. He believed himself to be a huge failure. Now, with that being said, this is my first time watching On the Waterfront, and I am so excited to get into it. But before we do, y'all know the deal. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel and hit that bell notification to stay in the loop. All right, everyone, it is time to grab your snacks, grab your drinks, and let's get in to On the Waterfront. Uh oh, people are waiting for him on the roof. He's like knowingly letting him walk into a trap. <laughs> and threw him all the way down to the bottom. I figured the worst I was gonna do was lean on him a little bit. He wasn't a bad kid, that Joey. Maybe he could sing, but he couldn't fly. <laughs> <laughs> he was the only longshoreman that had the guts to talk to them crime investigators. Oh no. A stool pigeon? That's why he got lured by a pigeon. 
I've been on the docks all my life. You don't ask no questions, you don't answer no questions unless you want to wind up like that. Exactly. Keep your mouth shut and just do your work and go home. <laughs> I want to know who killed my brother! I mean, he kind of aided in it, so like, but he wasn't the one that pushed him. He definitely was the one that aided in it. She's, she's looking for blood. Hiya, slugger. Hiya, Johnny. Where's that big banker of mine? Right here, Mr. Friendly. Here's the interest on the day, boss. Hey, Skins. You handle that sheet metal all right? Oh, yeah. If I take the receipt, here it is. You want to talk to me? Take the cigar out of your mouth. Stow the receipt. I'll take the cash. Yeah, sure, yeah. Gotta love the, the names that these mobsters give each other. Like the nicknames, like Skins, Curly, Johnny Friendly, you know? <laughs> what? Where do they even come up with these names? I lost the count. The only arithmetic he ever got was hearing the referee kind of pretend. You're not too funny today, fat man. What gives with our boy tonight? Just the Joey Doyle thing and how he's eating. That Doyle bum who thinks he can go squealing to the crime commission, do you? Malcolm Johnson, the one who wrote, originally wrote the articles, like, was he safe? Because the excerpts that I read did give a lot of information. I'm just, I'm nervous. I, I need to know more about that. Well, no, Johnny. I, I make it 26, 23. I must have miscounted. Give me. Give me. Oh, dang. Skins was freaking. Was he stealing from him? You don't work here no more. Present from your Uncle Johnny. I don't forget it. Why should you forget it? Look, he, I think he wants out of whatever it is he's in. Maybe. Maybe after seeing, like, the anger of the sister, or just maybe he's tired of it. I don't know. Hey, you're Terry Malloy, aren't you? What do you want? Waterfront Crime Commission. What's that? Oh, I just want to ask you a few questions. No, 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 no. I'm not talking. Well, I don't know nothing. There's a rumor that you're one of the last people to see Joey Doyle alive. He's like, I didn't see nothing. I didn't do nothing. I didn't hear nothing. He's like, I'm not trying to fall off of a roof. I guess I spoke out of turn last night. I see the sisters taught you not to lie. You think I'm just a gravy train rider with a turned around collar. I don't know how much I can do, but I'll never find out unless I come down here and take a good look for myself. He definitely has, I think that's Carl Malden, but he definitely has that like good boy face, you know? Hey, who do you see to get a day's pay around? Here, Frank, Frank, Mac, I got a couple of kids. Hey, Mac. <laughs> Is throwing the money, hoping they'll grab one. That's no civilized way to pay your workers. Come on, let's go get a ball. Is this all you do? Just take it like this? No other union in the country would stand for a thing like that. Name one place where it's safer even talk without getting clobbered. The church. Is he trying to like? Is he like a good, honest father, or is he kind of like trying to make a buck too? I'm just curious. I'm just asking. I don't know. The priest and this Doyle girl are getting a meeting up together down at the church. We want a rundown on it. The names and the numbers of all the players. Well, why me, Charlie? Johnny wants a favor. Don't think about it. So they're trying to run some sort of stint in the in the church, I'm thinking? Or is this good honest work? Let's let's just listen in, because I feel like it's not. Isn't it simple as one, two, three? The working conditions are bad because the mob does the hiring, and the only way we can break the mob is to stop letting them get away with murder. Who killed Joey Doyle? Okay, so he's on the good side. He's on the he's the good father, okay. Just want to make sure. How can we call ourselves Christians and protect these murders with our silence? One thing you got to understand, Father, on the dock we've always been D and D. There's one thing we've got in this country, and that's ways of fighting back, testifying for what you know is right against what you know is wrong. But like, how do you fight back if they also own the law enforcement and the politics and the government? Like, what's the point of talking? You know. <laughs> Are they intimidating these men? He's like, I know the likes of these people, and I know exactly where they're gonna go. <gasps> oh my god. All right, he's an old man. They won't hurt him. Um, I think they're hurting him, man. Are you all right, dude? You still D and D? You still call it ratting? Are you on the level? What do you think? I really like his character in this because he's so determined to do the right thing, and I, I feel his passion, and I feel the depth and the level he's willing to go. He does it with such conviction, and I really like that he's really committed to that purpose, you know? Everybody loved Joey. Did you know him very well? Well, you know, he got around. I guess they don't let you walk with fellas where you've been, huh? Are you training to be a nun? It's a regular college. run by the, the Sisters of St. Anne. You want to be a teacher. I would feel a sense of guilt because he literally was the one that lured the kid to the roof to be tossed off of it. And now he's talking to his sister. I'd feel a little, a little bit of guilt. Well, you, don't, you don't remember me, do you? I remember you were in trouble all the time. I thought they was gonna beat an education out of me. How would you have done it? With a little more patience and kindness. I noticed that he likes to put things in his mouth as he's acting. I've noticed that. Is that is that just a coincidence? Or has that happened throughout his career? Here's your bus ticket. You're on your way back to St. Anne's. I'm not ready to go back yet, Mom. Do you know who Terry Malloy is? He's the kid brother of Charlie the Gent. Johnny Friendly's right hand. I promised your mom, Edie. Don't let her down. I'm gonna stay, Pop. 
And I keep on trying to find out who is guilty for Joey. She's gonna figure it out and it's gonna break her heart because she's gonna start falling in love with Terry Malloy. Take a look at the champion flock of the neighborhood. Golden Warriors. You might say that I was the original Golden Warrior. Why does he look so much older? Like, what did he go through in three years? He must have gone through something traumatic. Like, I don't know why he looks like he's aged so much. Joey used to race pigeons. I've been taking care of them. You know, this city is full of hawks. That's a fact. They hang around on top of the big hotels. Okay, I have a story about that. I know we're watching a movie. I just have to tell the story really quick. So I live in Arizona, right? And so there were these like huge like birds of prey. They were massive. So one day I went outside in the back when I used to live with my parents and I remember seeing feathers everywhere because we have like pigeons around, right? So it was like a trail of feathers that led to the back, like the side back of our house. And as we, as I got further, there was a freaking pigeon that was literally like gutted, okay? I know that's that's disgusting, but listen, there are legitimately like freaking cannibalist birds flying around in Arizona. It's the scariest thing I've ever seen in my life. I want to show you something. What do you think of that bun? He's a beauty. You know, if another bun tries to come along and take his place, he really lets them have it. One thing about them, though, they're very faithful. They get married just like people until one of them dies. Is that true? Or is that just like made up for the movie? Because that's the cutest thing I've ever heard in my life. You really have Fighter. I used to be. What do you really care, am I right? Shouldn't everybody care about everybody else? He wanted my philosophy of life. Do it to him before he does it to you. Get rid of him. Is that your idea? Listen, it wasn't my fault what happened to Joey. Who said it was? Yeah, who said it was? In this movie, he definitely seems a lot more like, like not too like, like walking on eggshells with him, but you can see the distinction in his characters, which is always a good sign of good actors. <laughs> Distinction. Listen, down here, it's every man for himself. I'd rather live like an animal and end up like... Like Joey. Are you afraid to mention his name? Yes, because he helped aid in his murder. Edie, I'd like to help. I'd like to help, but nothing I can do. He's looking at her so intently. Also, are those his eyelashes or is that a scar? It's a scar. I was going to say, he has some beautiful eyelashes, but it's just a scar. Can you just stay here and finish your drink? Oh, listen, don't go. Life to the way he's looking at her is so like he's trying to grab something from her emotionally, I think. And not in a bad way, just like he's, you know what I'm saying? What for? Not being no help to you. You would if you could. Oh, it's perfectly manicured eyebrows. If I had my tuxedo, I'd ask you to dance, but come on, you want to Spin. She's gonna fall in love with the wrong one. They're putting love in this film and like there are just some films that like don't need to have a romance story. Hopefully nobody comes for me in the comments. You're uh, being served with a subpoena, Mr. Malloy. Something like that. I told you, I don't know nothing about that. So they're asking to question him. I ain't gonna eat cheese for no cups and that's for sure. It was Johnny Friendly who had Joey killed, wasn't it? You can't tell me, can you? Because you're part of it. Pop said Johnny Friendly used to own you. Well, I think he still owns you. He's probably afraid because he doesn't want to die. I mean, but also, yeah, he probably is afraid of Johnny, I'm not going to lie. But you're going to keep your eye on that church meeting. I was there. The priest did all the talk. Half an hour later, Timothy J. Dugan had a secret session with a crime commissioner. Well, Dugan, what does he know? Just 39 pages of our operation. No more cushy job in the law. It's down in the hole with a sweat gang till you learn your lesson. One thing I love about this particular role of Brando's, he really gets to exercise his more emotional side. Come on out, K.O., get it up! Hi, take it out. You see the advantage of a little man in a big coach. <laughs> <gasps> oh no. Oh, oh, he's dead. Oh, he's dead. Oh, he's no longer alive. Dang, I liked him too. He was really witty. I liked his quips. Dropping a sling on K.O. Dugan because he was ready to spill his guts tomorrow. And every time the mob puts the pressure on a good man to stop him from doing his duty as a citizen, it's a crucifixion. Come back to your church, father. Boys, this is my church. I love his conviction in this role. He's so passionate. Like, I believe him. Now, what does Christ think of the easy money boys who do none of the work and take all of the gravy? And how does he, who spoke up against every evil, feel about your silence? Tell him about that! Maybe this was a way for them, for Schulberg, for Johnson to deal with the crime that was happening around this area. Terry! I brought you Joey's jacket. Yours is coming apart. I'm sorry, it just, it feels wrong. It feels forced. I don't like it. Started out as a favor. I never figured it was gonna knock him off. What are you gonna do about it? 
What do you mean about telling her? They're asking me to put the finger on my own brother. So you've got a brother, eh? You've got some other brothers. And they're getting a shorthand while your Johnny's getting mustered on his face at the polo grounds. You know, this really reminds me eerily about the altercation with Elia Kazan basically ratting out his fellow communist buddies to the Un-American Activities Committee. And I wonder if that had an angle in it too. Edie called me this morning. She's coming here to talk. Come on, why don't you tell her? Okay. I swear to God, Edie. Oh, and they're putting like the boat sound over it. It would have been difficult had the antagonists, which I don't know, the mobs were like also communists. Like that would be really, really over the top. Didn't I see you in the garden three, four years ago? I thought you were going to take him that night. Man, he really dumped you. What would you say if I told you I held that bum up for half a round? Why didn't you finish him off? Oh, what are you talking about finish him off? I was doing a favor. If I had to put him down, I'd have had a title shot. My own girl. They fix some um, boxing matches in the favor of one another for gambling. I had a bum all figured out. I step inside a jet, flop with a left, flop with a right, flop with a left. When those guys want to win a bet, there's left they won't stop at. Mm. Have him s talking. I sure seen him nose to nose like a pair of lovers. Now that doesn't mean he's going to talk. This girl and the father, they got the hooks in the kid so deep. Mm. I ain't interested in his mental condition. All I want to know is, is he D&D &D or is he a canary? That's what a good woman will do to you, make you sing like a canary. <laughs> Drive him out to this place we've been using. If you don't, give him to Jerry G. He's just a confused kid. Confused kid? Pretty soon I'm just another fella around here. It's my kid, brother. That's for you to figure out. He's like pleading with Johnny in his eyes. He's like, please, this is my kid brother. Like, please don't make me do this. And there's a vulnerability there. It shows a moment of humanity. And I really like that. I've been wanting to talk to you. The grapevine says that you got, you got a subpoena. They think maybe you should not be on the outside so much and have a few little things working for you down at the docks. There's more to this than I thought, Charlie. You don't mean that you're thinking of testifying against some people that we might know. That was sent to me, Terry. Take the job. Just take it. No what? questions. Take it. You gonna, you gonna shoot me? Brother? I'm not gonna take the job, Charlie. That uh, skunk we got you for the manager, he brought you along too fast. You remember that night in the garden? You said, kid, this ain't your night. I could have taken Wilson apart. You was my brother. You should have looked out for me. I could have been a contender. I could have been somebody instead of a bum. Just sort of the defeat and the disappointment is so palpable, even on his face, on Brando's face. Oh no. He's done for. I want you to stay away from me. I ain't gonna do it, so forget it. I want you didn't to say I didn't love you. I said stay away from me. She's like, stay away, but kiss me because I love you. Your brother's down here. He wants to see ya. Oh no, that doesn't sound very good. Charlie, I think he's in trouble. Be careful. And she goes and opens the window. You know there are these things called guns, right? <laughs> They're trying to run you over. Oh my god. I'm gonna take it out of this. Go. He's really, really committing to this role. And there's just so much, there's so much range for him to really explore. I think he's doing a fantastic job. Where's John Friendly? He's not here now. Liz, sit down. I wonder if they're scared. I wanna see you, Terry. I'm right in front of you. I'm right in front of you. Here I am, you can see me. You wanna hurt Johnny Friendly? You wanna hurt him? You wanna fix him? He's like, do it in court. You find him in the courtroom tomorrow with the truth. Like he has a point though. Just stay alive until tomorrow. Unless you haven't got the guts, and then if you haven't, then you better hold on. This father is the real MVP of this movie, bro. I mean, Terry is, he is going through a range of emotions, but I mean, the father is just the constant. He is just the real MVP. Next witness, Mr. Malloy. Say it, Terry, say it with your chest. Would you say, Mr. Malloy, that Mr. Friendly made it very clear to you that he murdered Joey Doyle in order to maintain his control? Is that correct? Mr. Friendly calls, I'm out. Oh, he's losing his business. Oh, man. You've begun to make it possible for honest men to work the docks with peace of mind. Oh my god, he looks like he's gonna kill him. Oh my god. Primal look of just, I'm gonna murder you. Everybody works today! Where do we get off this front page? That is mine. I want him. Why is he not in jail right now? Why is he, like, just out? Does he know that John Friendly's out? Where them cops of yours, Stuart? You're gonna need them. 
All these men are going down there just to see a freaking fight. Oh, Terry, 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 Terry. John Friendly, come out of there. You take them heaters away from you and you're nothing. You know that? You ratted on us, Terry. I was ratting on myself all them years. I didn't even know it. You think you're God Almighty, but you know what you are? You're a cheat. I wonder if some of the men watching this are secretly like proud of what Terry did. They just can't say anything. Like, I wonder if they're like, at least someone had the guts to stand up, you know? That's what I'm hoping anyway. Come on! Oh, he started it. Oh no. Oh no. <laughs> He's doing those small punches. <laughs> oh God, his henchmen. All these guys could have easily taken these like five guys and they just sat there. Some friends they are. Oh, you guys get to work. He don't work, we don't work. Oh, there you go. They had me angry for a second. All my life you pushed me around. Oh, hey! fuck it, fuck it. Thank you. Somebody needed to do it. Jeez. I'm still not. Ugh, it's just freaking annoying. They easily could have overpowered those guys, but whatever. Whatever. Yeah, he got the snot kicked out of him. Oh, okay. This does sort of resemble uh like the cru like he was saying a crucifixion where Jesus was walking alone with the cross. All right, let's go to work. And nope, they are out of there, buddy. I remember every one of you. <sighs> what a movie! What a movie indeed. So I understand the significance of him having to fight his own battle. I'm not gonna lie though, I wanted them to kick some ass. I, I'm sorry, I'm like, you guys overpower this one mobster, like you could get him. But whatever, they wanted to take the high road and they wanted to be like, you know, we're gonna take our union back, which I respect, I respect that. Just know that if it were me, I would have been on their asses. I'm just saying, that's all I'm saying. Okay, now that we've gotten that out of the way, um, I thought that this was a really great film for Marlon Brando to really showcase his emotional side, where Streetcar was very erratic and very explosive. On the Waterfront was a lot more emotional and a lot more vulnerable, which I find it so strange that he said that he thought that he, like this was embarrassing for him to watch because I thought it was really beautiful. I thought it was, it really allowed the audience to empathize with him and feel like, like relate to him. He was showing like a vulnerable part of himself, which I really loved. And it's just a testament to how, how committed he is to his characters and how willing he is to allow them to shine versus, you know, he's like an actor instead of being like a celebrity, if that makes sense. And I think that, yeah, this was one of his greatest performances. I think he did a fantastic job. As far as the story goes, I'm really concerned. Like I hope that Malcolm Johnson and everyone else affiliated with this story was like safe afterwards. Cause I feel like from what I read, like I would have been nervous to be in this film or I would have been nervous to write those articles. You know, I don't know, maybe that's just me. So I hope that they were okay. The, the story was really good. I wasn't a fan of the romance. I don't think think it was necessary. Um, he easily could have just had a change of heart. I guess, I guess he would need a motive as to why. He could have just been a rem like a remorseful person, but I felt like the romance was kind of forced and I did not feel the chemistry at all, but that's just a personal, that's just a personal thing. And yeah, I think everyone else was really good. I, I oh my God, I loved, I think it was Carl Malden. He was like the MVP of the movie, bro. A constant, always like just being like the voice of reason, the voice of goodness and trying to speak like talk some sense into these men to stand up against the bad guy. And then also I felt like this was a sort of like allegory, I guess if that's the right word, to tell Elia Kazan's side of why he decided to come clean to the whack um, and why he ended up ratting out some of his friends, which was not a popular thing at the time and really blackballed him. So I can see like the similarities. Maybe that was his way of saying, hey, this is why I did this because it's the right thing to do. I don't know. It seems like that would be it. But yeah, overall, this was a very interesting film. Definitely not what I was expecting going into it, but I was pleasantly surprised. Thank you guys so much for choosing this film and thank you guys so much for watching it with me. All right, everyone, that does it for this video. As always, if you liked it as much as I did, please give it a thumbs up. Also, if you would like to become an official MWMer, then please hit that subscribe button and that bell notification to stay in the loop.
If you would like to see this film's full reaction, you will find it on my Patreon. There is also where I hold my MWM live watch parties, where we come together and we watch one classic film live via Zoom. If you would like to recommend any classic Hollywood films, then please reach out to me on social media, on Facebook and X or Twitter at Movies with Mia, and on Instagram and TikTok at Movies with Mia underscore. If social media is not your jam, fear not. I do have an email. My email is miawilliams642 at gmail.com. And while you're online, why not check out my Letterboxd account? There is where I have a full documentation of all of the films we've seen on the channel. So if you're interested in that, it is under the handle at Mamma Mia Tiffany. And yeah, that is all I have for you guys for today's video. If you have watched all the way to this point, you guys are rock stars. Thank you so much for sticking with me to the end. We made it. Please, as always, stay safe and healthy out there, and I'll see you, boo, in the next video. Bye, everyone. Yes, I'm wearing my ACDC shirt because I feel like a freaking rock star today. You're welcome. Just wanted to show you guys that. Even though you can't see it, just know that it is it is here. Due to the deep and powerful connect. Let me try it again. People in their cars revving it up so everyone in the world can hear them. It's very annoying. Cohn was concerned about some of the predi predictions. Depictions? How did I get predictions out of that? That's weird. They had first taken their idea to 21st, 20th Century Fox. Did I say 21st? Hopefully there's nothing on my teeth. Bye!